you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. What you are about to hear is real. The prophets wrote of a time when the signs of the end would be seen. This is where Bible prophecy and current events collide. This is Unsealed. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to Unsealed. Pastor Christopher Manti is me. You are you, and Jesus is God. Uh, and amen. Praise the Lord for you all. Um, it's been a little bit here since we've done a podcast um, here for Unsealed, so want to make sure to get back on that and get you involved. If you are listening live, watching live, uh, definitely go ahead and make a comment or ask a question or what have you right there in the chat uh, of your forum and I'll get to it at some point I promise um, and as long as it's not rude or obscene um, we'll answer it all right praise the Lord guys and please before we get any further please share this podcast, this video, this audio, whatever format you're listening on, caring is sharing, and that's not just a clever rhyme. That is the truth. If you think this is worthwhile, share it with your friends. You reach way more people than you think you do. Um, so use your social channels, your emails, whatever you got. Word of mouth, of course, but sharing is caring, okay? And please give to the ministry if this blesses you, if you think this is an effective outreach of the gospel and the word of God out to the world, uh, please give then, wingsoftheeagle.com slash donate. You can hear and see all, well, you can hear all the previous episodes of Unsealed at the website we have set up called unsealedpodcast.com. And so please do that. We are now in the second season, I guess wrapping up the second season uh, of the show here in 2021, and uh, just a great honor to be able to do this. So, let's get into it. Um, the great issue that uh, some people are very, very interested about, which is um, not insignificant, but kind of a almost a quickly kind of noted thing in uh, the book of Revelation is the sealing of the 144,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so let's look at that source text real quick, and then I'm going to get into, I think, another part of the Bible that actually fleshes that out um, for us. All right, so I'm going to bookmark that second spot and go to the source, which is Revelation chapter 7, uh, as well as 14. So blessings to you, my friends. Thank you in YouTube land and Facebook world and Twitterverse and everything else. Australia, bless the Lord. Thank you, Brother Isaac. Yes, we truly do. Um, the Lord does provide for worldwide audience here, which is amazing. Okay, here's the, here's the source, okay? After this, John sees the seven seals, okay? But then after this, he saw something else. I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so no wind could blow on the earth, or on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, or the rising of the sun, who had the seal of the living God. And he shouted. Now, first of all, like the name of our show here, Unsealed, right? The graphic is um, a scroll or, you know, a 
paper that's been written on and it's sealed with um, you know wax or something else uh, that would hold it shut to deliver the message right when you're carrying it and then the reader when they received it would break the seals and then you would know that only the one who um, was supposed to have it had it and who sealed it like I'm the author or the, the ruler or whatever so if this angel had the seal of the living God it means he probably means he has like um he had the signet, the the actual um, imprint, the the logo, the you know the the symbol, and you would take that that instrument and actually stick it in, you know, like press on to the the hot wax or whatever to create that um, to put that seal in there, so you would know who signed it, you know, who sealed it. So I'm thinking, it says he has the seal of the living God like he's carrying the instrument. He shouted with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given permission to damage the earth and the sea. Do not damage the earth or the sea or the trees until we have put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Now I heard the number of those who were marked with the seal, 144,000, sealed from all the 12 tribes of the people of Israel, or the sons of Israel. And then, of course, it lists out 12,000 from the tribe of Judah, from the tribe of Reuben, Gad, okay? These are the actual sons of Israel. The one note, and we, we've done this before, but the, the son Dan, one of the sons of Israel, is not listed in this um, this list, but instead you have uh, Manasseh and Joseph both represented, where Joseph obviously was the father of Manasseh, so Dan got replaced. See Judges 18 for that reason. Um, anyways, so there it is. Um, that's the ceiling, and they... So before, what what are these, the damage of the earth and the sea and the trees, that happens in chapter 8 uh, when you have the first four trumpets. Okay, so this is saying before the trumpets start to blow, whatever you believe that to be, okay, uh, before the trumpets are sounded, the seven trumpets begin, um, we have to seal these 144,000, okay? And now let's just look real quick at uh, chapter 14 because they're mentioned there again as well. In a very interesting place. Then I looked, and this is after we hear all about the um, the beast and the mark of the beast and all that stuff, and uh, we have the seal of God and the mark of the beast. So they're actually very similar um, images. Then I looked, and here was the lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you believe in the Son, you write all that. Okay, we know this is Jesus. So these 144,000 are following Jesus. They're, they're believers, they're Christians, or however you want to term it. Um... I also heard a sound coming out of heaven like the sound of many waters and the sound of like loud thunder. The sound I heard was made by harpists playing their harps. Um, they were singing a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. No one was able to learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. We know there are a lot more than 144,000 Christians, right? Regardless of what a cult would tell you. Uh, the, so there's, it can't just be a generic Christian, and I don't, don't take that wrong, I'm just saying it's more specific than that. Those who, uh, these are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins, and they are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from humanity as first fruits to God and to the Lamb, and no lie was found in their lips, they are blameless." And then the angels come and announce the wrath of God is about to him. Okay, so we have the 144,000 are sealed before the trumpets. And then after the trumpets, they're on Mount Zion calling, or with Jesus, it says. It says. 
of course, Mount Zion is in Jerusalem. Um, near the Temple Mount, but not the same mountain. Um, I've been on both, by the way. Pretty cool. Um, okay, so that that's it. Uh, that's that's the 144,000 information in Book of Revelation. So, first of all, I think it's... It, we're just told it's clear wh- who they are. Because number... You know, some folks... Um, there's still some debate. I, I don't know if there's a lot right now anymore, but um, who the 144,000 are, you were told who they are. They are Jewish people. They are of the tribes of Israel. Each and every tribe. Right? It's not even a, uh, some kind of statement where you could spiritualize it away. And they follow the Lamb. That means they're Messianic Jewish believers. That's what it means to me. Because that's what it says. And, oh, well, do you think this number is literal, or is it, or is it symbolic? Um, okay, I mean, I could see where 12,000 times 12, you know, is a symbolic thing. Some kind of, I've heard it said, governmental completion or whatever. And, okay, fine, but that doesn't mean it's not literal also. And it is literal. I, I don't see how it can't, right? Um, how it can't be. So... I think we just have to, as always, take the word at face value unless it's specifically describing a a figure of speech or, um, you know, a vision or, you know what I mean, something that's clearly metaphorical. If it's cl- if it's a parable or a metaphor, it will tell you that it's a metaphor or, sh- you know, like a beast from the sea. You're not actually looking for a sea monster because it's it, we are told it's not that. It's different than it's just a uh, representation of something else. But th- this 144,000 Jews, I don't. there's no representation of anything. It is what it is. That's what it means. It would be, okay, what do I believe about the 144,000 Jews? I believe there are 144,000 Jews of Israel. And don't, don't get that twisted up, please. Yes, all the tribes are called Jews now. Um... They, uh, yeah, they're sealed with the living God, which means they've been saved by Jesus. They are believers before the trumpets begin. And then after the trumpets, then they go to Mount Zion. And, well, they were not told what exactly. They're just there with Jesus. So either he's returned already or they're calling for him to return, which is something Jesus did say, right? You, Jerusalem, where Mount Zion is, you Jews will not see me again until you say, Berukov Avashem Yehovah, call for me to come back. Anyway, so what's the other portion that we can look at to get some flesh on this? I think you look at Ezekiel chapter 8 and 9. Um, because you have some incredibly similar situations here going on. All right, so what's the, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 8 first of all. Um, Again, the lead-up is in uh, the other chapters and whatever, but by their standard of justice, I will judge them like the Lord said, judge not lest you should be judged. So he's going to judge Israel. By the way, I hope we have a good connection that stays because we've got some wicked wind here today in my office. Um, Okay, in the sixth year, chapter 8, in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, I was sitting in my house with the elders of Judah, sitting in front of me, the hand of the Sovereign Lord seized me. I watched a form that appeared to be a man, from his waist downwards, something like fire. So he seized, he seized the Lord on the throne, okay, just like in Revelation, only with more uh, details. He grabbed him by the hair, and a wind lifted me up by the earth and the sky and brought me to Jerusalem by divine vision. So he was, remember, Ezekiel was in part of the um, diaspora. He was taken um, into Babylon. So he's prophesying this, and he's seeing his visions, and he's writing this from Babylon after the first temple fell, after Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians, to King Nebuchadnezzar, right? So it's within that period, after Nebuchadnezzar and before they're allowed to return. So he's in exile. So he's actually, it says, in a vision taken back to Jerusalem, where he is shown the door of the inner gate that faces north of the temple, the north gate of the temple, Temple Mount, 
that faces north where the image that provokes to jealousy was located. Image? Or some say statue, some translations, or some say idol. I don't know what that's about. I mean, what is this? Um, we can only guess, basically. But here's the thing. We know that there's an image to the beast. It's going to be set up in the abomination of desolation in the temple before Jesus returns. So this should get our attention, okay? regardless of what it was. Was Ezekiel shown the future? Or the present? Oh, we, don't, we don't know. Um, the statue of jealousy, it's called. The image of jealousy. So, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the people of Israel are practicing. Well, obviously, the end time, it's going to be the enemy of Israel who will set up the abomination in this temple and put up the image. So it's not exactly one for one, but it is interesting. Um, and he goes on to detail four abominations in the temple before the judgment begins. All right, before, let's back up. The first verses here give us a date, right? The sixth month, the sixth year, the sixth year we assume means in the, the reign of, you know, they were counting. Um, but first of all, it's six, six, and five. The sixth year, the sixth month, and the fifth of the month. So that's interesting. It's not quite six, six, six. It's just one away. So we're almost there, uh, is, the, is the spiritual understanding, perhaps, of that. However, also of note, uh, is that the sixth month, when that ends, what happens? The seventh month starts. What happens on the first day of the seventh month, according to Leviticus 23? The Feast of Trumpets. So before the trumpets begin, in fact, three and a half weeks, weeks before the trumpets begin, that's where we're at. This is the fifth day of the month. So 25 days later is the first where the trumpets begin. 25 days is three and a half weeks. Okay? So, so three and a half weeks before the trumpets begin, we have this vision shown to Ezekiel uh, by God. Okay, now it's a, a statue or an idol of jealousy in uh, in the temple, there are four abominations listed, and by the way, it has to do with the 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel. So this is um, Numbers 11, is it, uh, Exodus 24, um, where he got appoint Moses, right? He appoints 70 elders to carry out the duties of uh, keeping Israel as a nation or whatever. Okay, so you've had, they've gone bad. Okay, they've gone sour. This is not a good situation. So we've had four uh, abominations. Uh, the statue, the image itself, um, every creeping, every image of every creeping thing and beast, detestable images of every idol. So that's, you have one big one, and then in secret you have more. So that's abomination number two. In three, the entrance to the north gate, I saw women there weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz is a false... Uh, a false god, okay, you could say Allah if you'd like. Uh, that's abomination number three. You will see even greater abominations than these, he says. Okay, and then number four. Between the porch and the altar, 25 men with their backs to the temple, worshiping the sun. So that's just going right back to paganism 101, right? Uh, so that's the fourth. And what is it, when it says between the porch and the altar, what happens there? That's, first of all, Joel 2.17. Uh, we are to weep between the porch and the altar, but not for Tammuz and not to worship the sun, but to repent to the God of Israel and ask him to come deliver us, right? Um, this is also between the porch and the altar where Jesus said that the prophet Zechariah, or righteous Zechariah, was murdered in Matthew 23. When, when Jesus says stuff, we got to pay attention, okay? All right. So that's four abominations. He says, do you see these things, son of man, right? Yada, yada. Yeah, these are, these are what I'm going to punish Israel for, he's, he said. God says. Read the chapter for yourself. It's only 18 verses. 
So we have this period of three and a half weeks before the trumpets, four abominations in the temple by Israel, and then we have chapter 9. Let me see if I missed any notes here. I'm, I'm using t I've got two study, two study Bibles that I use, and I mark them all up and make little notes in the margins and highlights and all that. Um, so, right, Ezekiel's in Babylon, uh, the image of the beast, uh, secret room, all of the leaders, 70 men. Luke chapter 10, by the way, remember, he sends out the, the, uh, the disciples in a group of 70 as well. Um, the incense in Malachi 1.11, he says, Each man stood with a censer in his hand, and thick cloud of incense went up. That's supposed to be your prayers. Uh, but in Malachi 1.11, uh, he's saying that Israel has failed, and I need to raise up a new priesthood, like the Gentiles. Just interesting. Um, and between the porch of the altar of the temple, how can this be? This, I love this Bible to death. It's the Thompson chain reference. Um, New King James Version. It, I love it. It's my absolute favorite. But it says some wrong things sometimes. Like the note on that, um, on Ezekiel 8, um, 16, is claiming that this is Solomon's temple. What? It's Solomon's temple is destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Anyways, um, and they're worshiping the sun. Okay, then chapter 9. Now here's where it gets really interesting. <clears throat> so we have this period where these the, we're in Israel, there's great evil, there's great abominations happening. It has to do with the temple. It has to it's it's revealed to Ezekiel in the three and a half weeks before the trumpets, before the feast of trumpets, okay? And there's four things that are happening. Do you remember? Let's go back, rewind, flash back to what we just read in Revelation uh, 7. That there were four angels being held back from punishing or hurting, harming the earth itself. The, the earth, the trees, right? The rivers, the water, sea, the sea. Um, They're held back, those four, until these 144,000 could be sealed. Then they would begin. Okay. So now we have four abominations in chapter 8 um, from... Uh, Israel itself. Then we have in chapter 9, approach you who are to visit this destruction on the city, each with a destructive weapon in his hand. Then I notice six men, or uh, let me pull up the um, amplified version of this. It's very interesting. Uh, Ezekiel 9. Approach now, executioners of the city, each with his weapon of destruction in his hand. Behold, six men, angelic beings, which I believe is correct, came from the direction of the upper gate which faces north, each which with his battle axe in his hand, and among them was a certain man clothed in linen with a scribe's writing case at his side. They entered and stood beside the bronze altar. So this is six angels with battle weapons, and then a seventh one that has a different job that's different from the others. Are we clicking right now? Seven trumpets sound after the ceiling, and the seventh definitely is different than the, the other six. All right, so with that in mind, who we look, is that who are we looking at? Is that Michael, the seventh one? I don't know. Um, why did I say that? Because it says he is clothed in linen. Well, that's how Daniel uh, describes Ar Archangel Michael. So whatever, it's really not important. Um, all right, so let's, let's read on. Then the Shekinah glory... The glory and brilliance of God of Israel, the cloud, went up from the cherubim on which it had rested. Now, wait a minute. This is way back to Ezekiel's original vision of the throne of God and the crazy the wheels and the cherub and the spirit moving them and right, that whole thing. Um, you would call them the zoi, the zoon of Revelation in Greek. It went up on which it had rested to stand above the threshold of the Lord's temple, and the Lord called to the man clothed with linen who had the scribe's writing case at his side. 
What, what, what would a scribe have in a writing case? Things to write with or things to mark things with. Uh, implements of, you know, utensils like scroll paper or like instruments to mark things. Like, remember we said the seal of the living God, the angel came with the seal. Okay. Well, what's his job? Go through the midst of the city, God says, throughout all Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh in distress and grieve over all the repulsive acts which are being committed in it. But to the others, I heard him say, follow him, the man with the writing case, throughout the city and strike. Do not let your eyes have pity and do not spare anyone. Slay old men, young men, maidens, little children and women, but do not touch or go near anyone on whom is the mark. Or the seal, you could say. Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the old men who were in front of the temple who did not have the Lord's mark on their foreheads. And he said to the executioners, defile the temple and fill its courtyards with the dead. Go out. So they went out and struck down the people in the city. And as they were executing them, I alone was left, Ezekiel. I fell face downward and cried out, Alas, Lord God, will you destroy all that is left of Israel, the remnant? by pouring out your indignation on Jerusalem. Okay. Um, sounds like we have some judgment going on on Israel here. Begin at my sanctuary. Judgment begins at the house of God. This is literally the house of God. The temple. God was there. His glory was there. The cherub were there. The Shekinah glory was there. He was literally in the temple of God on the earth. That was the house of God. Judgment begins at the sanctuary, the holy of holies, or the holy place. Um, judgment begins there. Now, to me, this is really, really interesting now because we have seven angels carrying out judgment um, and after the sealing takes place. So it's a lot like the angel with the seal of the living God going out before the trumpet star, right? Seems like it. Um, go through the city and put a mark in the foreheads or um, Tav is the actual uh, Hebrew there. Tav, like a letter. The Aleph and the Tav, the, the, the end. This is the end. Um, anyway, it's interesting. Right, begin at my sanctuary. And then we destroy the whole remnant. But then he says what? We know that he won't destroy the whole remnant. He'll always leave a small amount. Like 144,000. For example. Um, and by the way, who, what, is the, what is the characteristic of those who get the seal? The Jews now, who in Jerusalem, this is a, there's a reason why this doesn't say anything other than it says, right? We're in the temple in Jerusalem, the people of the Jews themselves are the only ones who are sealed, just like in Revelation. It doesn't mean no one is saved. It doesn't mean th this is not um, common salvation. This is not Gentiles being saved and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. We know it's definitely that, we, but, okay, but there's a reason why God singles this, this group out in this place at this time. Well, like, of course, it still counts. If I'm sealed by God and saved in, you know, when I was eight years old in 1983, that's not before, right before the seven trumpets started, right? Uh, what about the Christians all the way down the centuries and the millennia, 2,000 years? 
Um, they're not excluded. They're not different. They're not. But at the very end, before the trumpets begin, God has singled out this group of Jews of Israel, in Israel most likely. I think it's actually for sure um, in the land who are sealed because there's judgments coming and they have to be protected. Now here's the thing. Another thing. <laughs> the final thing. Um. Two, two more things. What does it say when it says, do not do not touch anyone who has the mark? What does Revelation 9, 4 say? Revelation 9, from Ezekiel 9 to Revelation 9, Revelation 9 is in the middle of the seven trumpets. In fact, we're at trumpet number five, when it says the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. He had the key to the abyss given to him, and he opened it, smoke poured out, out comes the locust army, do not hurt the grass of the earth or any green thing or tree, which already happened in the first four trumpets, that was just to nature, okay, the natural creation, to the land, you could say, the land of Israel and surrounding, um, but not the people at this point, but now the fifth trumpet says only hurt the people who do not have the seal of god on their foreheads and even at that they're just allowed to torture those who do who do not have the seal um not to kill them that's the next trumpet um but okay so we have the first four Trumpets are against the, the the nature, you know, the natural, the land and the sea, etc. Uh, but then number five it starts with the people, and we know six. It says a third were killed, a third of men were killed. Now most people think again that's worldwide, but I'm saying maybe it's not, um, because it's focused somewhere uh, geographically. Um, now, finally, final thought on this is like, okay, so maybe we have the, the trumpets, the first four trumpets are against the physical earth and, the, you know, the land, and then the last ones are uh, on the people, against having to do with the people. First is torture, second is death, third actually is resurrection, right? The seventh trumpet is the return of Jesus and the resurrection of the saints, living and dead, those who are in Christ from all time given the new bodies. So that's at the last trumpet. That's the seventh. Um, that's definitely different than these other ones. But here's the final thought, which is Jesus' words in Luke 21. Let's go to that. Uh, Luke chapter 21, of course, this is kind of like the forgotten um, chapter of the end times. For some reason, everyone wants to say Ma Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Matthew 24. Okay. Yeah, but what about Mark 13? Because Mark 13 is exactly like Matthew 24. And what about Luke 21? Because <laughs> Luke 21 is the same information, only with different details. And all of a sudden, because of those different details, people want to assign it to 70 AD? Get real. It's ridiculous. Um, okay, and he's asked the same thing. When are these, what are the signs of your coming? And when are these things about to happen? Be careful you are not misled, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not panic. These things must take place first, but the end will not come immediately. That means there's signs before that. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, Isaiah 19. There's two kingdoms he's talking about. Violent earthquakes, plagues, famines, Epidemics, that's actually in the text of uh, Luke 21 in the Amplified. Terrible sights and great signs from heaven. Uh, skip down for a bit. It's talking about the Great Tribulation coming now. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by hostile armies, understand that her complete destruction is near, or desolation is near when you see you're surrounded by armies because they're about to be invaded. At that time, those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. And those who are inside the city of Jerusalem must get out. 
Those who are out in the country must not enter, for these are the days of vengeance, so all the things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those women who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, for great trouble or tribulation will be on the land, and wrath and retribution to this people. Jesus has two categories there. When the tribulation comes, when the abomination comes, there's two, seems, different or separate focuses of the judgment that are coming on Israel. The land and then the people. Could it be that that when Jesus says that, he's talking about the first four trumpets, when it says the land. And then, great retribution to this people, Israel, starting in trumpet five. And like Ezekiel 9 just says, we're going to seal them first, then we're going to go out with the seven angels with weapons. Begin at my sanctuary. Begin at the house of God. All right, guys. Um, that's that's the message. You have any questions or comments? Now is the time. Um, pray about it. Um, I mean, it it has implications certainly for. Um, and I'm. Brother David just asked a question about this topic that I'm about to say, so hang on a second. Um, it has implications if we understand the trumpets are only in the tribulation, great tribulation time, and not well, over the course of years and years, um, A, and B, if they're directed at Israel specifically, the land of Israel specifically, Right? I'm, I honestly, I never really considered that till this week. Never. I mean, I, I literally wrote a book on the subject. Um, I never really considered that this could just be um, talking about Israel, and that's why the 144,000 had to be in Israel to receive the sealing of the seal of God. They are saved, and they're basically immune from all these judgments that are coming because they're immune. God will protect them all the way to the end. He comes back to Mount Zion where they call for him and they meet him. Wow, wow, wow. Um, so think about it. Think about it, that if these trumpet judgments are not necessarily worldwide. Doesn't mean there won't be trouble. I don't know. I don't claim to have a, you know, God didn't speak to me directly and say, tell them this. But we, there's, it, this is how the end times are going to unfold, right? There's going to be more information uh, that just gets uncovered or unsealed because we just didn't see it before. Been there all along. Um, okay, let's take some questions here. Um, David says, What will the position in America be? Be, no, what will be the position in America during these times? Will it still be a superpower? It's fu I mean, I'm with you, brother. I'm an American. I'm, I think about that, too. But it's so funny because nobody else in the world thinks like that. You can't go to Australia or Africa or China or Belgium or whatever and think, what about... I wonder what's going to happen with my country. Like... That just shows you how self-absorbed we are, doesn't it? Um, will it still be a superpower? I don't know, honestly, Dave. I I don't. I have no clarification on that at all. To me, and I've said this every time it comes up, and people may think this is so annoying, but this is the best answer we got, which is if it's not in the Bible, all bets are off. If it's not specifically said what happens to your nation, and most nations are not mentioned, right? We know that. Um, we don't know. 
So that means the playbook is open, you could say, right? God has all the options. He could not change anything about America, or he could knock it down a little bit, or he could totally wipe it off the map. All of those things are possible. Um, I mean, I have opinions that probably we won't be very much of a power, um, or at least v greatly reduced at the best case um, during the end, because the beast empire, the one in the Middle East, is the one that gets all the power, not only from God, who allows it, but Satan empowers it. So it's, he's not looking at other countries, right? He's got, his, his empire is what the focus is, and that's, that's what God's focus is, honestly, because he pr already spoke it. In, in ahead of time in the Word of God, so he must make sure it's done. Um, so America's not in there either way, is the point. And yes, we could be totally brought down to nothing, we could be totally immaterial, we could be gone physically, we could, you know, nuclear war, I don't know. All of that, all of that could happen. I, I think probably we definitely will be knocked down a peg or two at least. But that's just an opinion, that's not, that's not scripture. Uh, Jay of Oz on YouTube says, do you think that the angels that are released from the bottomless pit? No. Do you think that, that a the angels that are released from the bottomless pit, if they didn't decide not to leave the bottomless pit, will they get time served from God? Uh, I'm not sure what that means, Jay. Um, they're there for a reason. And if you're talking about like the Jude and and Second Peter ones, um, probably the ones in the fifth trumpet, they're there for a purpose, and there's no forgiveness for them. I I think that's what you mean, but clarify if if I got it wrong. Blessings to Antony from East Africa, Kenya. Bless the Lord, indeed. Uh, Sam says, why are people tortured for five literal months by stings? Well, it stings like a scorpion, it, but these are not animals. They're not locusts. They just look like locusts, and they're not stinging you just like a scorpion. It's similar to that. Um... But again, that's what it literally says, right? It literally says they are not actual animals. In fact, Joel chapter 2, uh, what? 2? 3? 2. Uh, the locust army is there too, and it, God calls it my army, um, but there never has ever been anything like it and never will be again, it says. So these are supernatural entities. Uh, why will it be five literal months and stings? Will this be limited to the land of Israel? Uh, again, um, God God has his reasons for it to be five months. Uh, people have theories. I'm not going to go into that. Um, and what, the sting of a scorpion, it, it, what, I would just research that. You know, like figure out the science behind that. Like what happens when a scorpion stings you? Or it's, it's prey. It's, it's enemies. What happens to them? I think their nervous system gets shut down. Um, they can't resist. Um... They just want to die, but they, they're not going to. Stuff like that. And it may be limited to that place. In and around Israel, that's where God's focused. I'm just saying. Lion of Judah 77U. I, you know, I almost wish you two would make us use our real names. Okay, uh, America, a.k.a. Mystery Babylon. America is not Mystery Babylon, Lion of Judah. It is not. America is not Mystery Babylon. America is also not Israel. Do you understand? It's not possible. Mystery Babylon is a city, not a country. And a city in the desert by the sea. That doesn't fit America in any way. So don't overstate the evil of, of America, and we got to deal with the evil here. No doubt about it. I mean, God's going to deal with it. But we're not Mystery Babylon. Um, John says, well, I think it's supposed to be that America was founded to be a beacon for God. No. 
I don't I don't think so. I think you've been you've been uh brainwashed into that. No offense. I have been also. Um it's just, it's a country. And it's done a lot of good and it's been blessed, no doubt. But it does not overstate it. David, why is Egypt men- mentioned? Something must change our outlook, what we see. I'm sorry, what are you referring to? I didn't read anything about Egypt today, although of course they do play a role. Uh, they are the fourth part of the beast. There's the lion, the bear, and the leopard, and then they join in with the fourth to form the final beast. That's Egypt, and that's why there's a um, king of the north and king of the south war it's over Egypt in Isaiah 19. And that's one of the signs that Jesus says to watch for. Daniel Norman. Um, Dr. John Barnett, I don't know who he is, has a great study on Revelations, Revelation, the book, I assume you mean, that explains the 144,000 are from Israel and it's all about Jerusalem. Well, that's interesting. I may have to check that out. Um, okay, now we've got questions rolling in, and i got to be careful that I'm getting them. Um, I was, oh, Jay of Oz says, I was stating that their judgment be the time in the pit. No, N- no. I mean, I know people don't accept the book of Enoch as scripture, but uh, just in Jude and Peter... We, they sinned. They sinned. There's no. They're not men where they can be forgiven by the blood of Jesus. It's over for them. They knew what they were doing. Um, Rebecca says, "I think the 144,000 have already been marked." Okay. Why do you say that? I mean, I'm not just arguing with you, but why? What is the evidence of that? Uh, do you know? I mean, do you, how do you know? Do you know any of them? Who would t- can tell you that? I mean, just d- how many Messianic Jewish people are there in the world? Not many. Not many. And I know a few. Personally. <laughs> My friends. So, uh... When I tell one of them, specifically that lives in my town, um, just so happens she's not from here originally, but whatever, just happens to end up near me, um, or we near each other, and I say, "Ah, I think you're part of the 144,000. You're going to have to go witness to the beast. (laughs) She gets kind of nervous. So I I don't know why you say that, but I mean, I'd I'd like it to be true, but how do you know? What's your evidence? Um... David, again, I personally believe God stops all oil production. You're talking about the Middle East, I guess. Because in the last war, Armageddon, people will still be fighting on horseback. Maybe an EMT is used. Okay, uh, it, right. It, I mean, it, you're talking about the six seal, the horsemen are 200 million. Uh, maybe, okay, maybe. Uh, it could just be a way of... John describing what he saw, and he doesn't know any other ways to put it, but maybe. Um, That's possible. Um, Knowledge is power. Channel 77. Will fallen angels be visible to humans during the tribulation? Um, I say yes, but again, that's just my guess, and they, that's just a guess. Educated, maybe, I don't know, but when Satan and his angels are cast out of heaven, will they be, I, I don't know, um, and again, what, what do you mean by fallen angels? The ones who are cast out with Satan at the three and a half year mark, or the ones who are in the great river Euphrates, or the ones who are unleashed from the abyss? in the fifth trumpet. You know what I mean? So maybe, you know what? I changed my answer to maybe. Um, 
I believe part of the book of Enoch is true, especially the part about the angels. I, I mean, the first, the first part of Enoch, like the first, you know, 10, 20, 30 chapters, it's very remarkable, I believe. Um... Jay of Oz, one more time. What about the ecumenical movement created by the Pope? I think he's the false prophet of Revelation. It is not possible that the Pope is the false prophet. First of all, it's not possible that anyone is the false prophet right now because he's not here. He on, Look at Revelation 13 carefully. He only exists during the final three and a half years of the final beast empire. That's it. He doesn't have any power before then. It doesn't even say he's a human being, to be honest with you. Um, but I, uh, even if it were to be a pope in the future, let's say we're coming to that time in some po- he would he would cease to be the pope because he wouldn't be a Christian. He wouldn't even acknowledge Jesus. He'd be an, a Muslim. If the, if, if the Islamic Antichrist theory is correct, and I believe it is, there is no, you can't have a Christian false prophet or one who even claims to be one. He will be a Muslim, Jesus pointing the way to the caliphate. Okay, there's no pope involved there. Even if it was an ex-pope who became that person, he would be an ex-believer at that point, a, an apostate from Christianity, not a pope. Um, again, with the mystery of Babylon, Lion, I really suggest you really rethink this, commit it to God, uh, read the scriptures, obviously. Don't have any suppositions or assumptions. Read the book Mystery Babylon by Joel Richardson. He debunks 1,000% accurately why America cannot be Mystery Babylon. He goes to Rome, the United States, you know, some world system, all that. He shows that it can't be true, biblically. Go read that. Um... He is not the false prophet. Stop it. Th- look, read the Bible again. There's nothing in there about any, any history of the false prophet. You're not going to know anything about him until the last three and a half years. Uniting religions together is not in the Bible. Uh, one world government is not in the Bible. Seriously. I know you've been taught that, especially by Western um, pseudo-teachers, but... It's not in there. All right? All right. Anyways, guys, there's no one world religion, okay? The Bible never says it. It's not going to happen. It says one religion will become dominant over the rest, and that's the Antichrist religion. There is no one world anything. He fights wars his entire time as the Antichrist. How is that possible if everyone's agreed? How is that possible if he controls everything? He doesn't. He won't. His kingdom is Middle Eastern. His religion is Middle Eastern. And it's not Jewish, okay? All right. Praise the Lord, everyone. Um, Oh, here's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. You don't need to read anything else because you've read Revelation, and I quote, for those of you on podcast, this is a quote, I read Revelation more than most people on earth. Boy, there's no pride there. you got to repent, sir. And no, John, the one world religion is not in the Bible. Show me. It ain't in there. All right. All right. Um, here, knowledge is power. Okay, we're really getting off track here. We're talking about the 144,000 in this episode. Beast was given authority to over all tribes and languages. What does that mean? Exactly what it says. Authority over means they, con- they uh, he dominates it. It doesn't mean he unites with it. Got it? All right. Praise the Lord, guys. I love you all so much. Until the next time, this is Pastor Christopher Manti. Please give if this has blessed you, if this answered any question you've ever had, if it raised new questions that maybe you never thought of before, if it made you think, if it made you go to to the Father in prayer. Praise the Lord for that and give to the ministry. Nothing but good things will come for everybody involved. I'm convinced. All right, wingsthatego.com slash donate. Until next time, this is Unsealed. Pastor Manti, Lord willing, see you Monday night for End Time Church. To hear previous episodes, to obtain resources, 
and to support this ministry, visit unsealedpodcast.com. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved.